To the untrained visitor, the Arabian Desert is a harsh land of empty spaces. But to those knowledgeable about when and where to look, it is an area full of life. As winter approaches and the relentless heat of the summer diminishes, a natural event of major proportions takes place. The migration of thousands of birds from north to south, moving ahead of the oncoming winter. This timeless cycle takes no notice of borders, national boundaries, or the politics of men. Instead, it moves according to the system of nature, around, through, and over centers of human habitation. Among the migrants come the normal range of predators, eagles, buzzards, hawks, and falcons. All kinds follow their instinctive need to move south and follow the path of their food supply. With the seasonal migration comes the opportunity to practice one of the world's oldest sports, falconry. Like many sports, falconry probably began as a more efficient means of catching food. Early men trained predators to capture prey which earthbound man could not hope to pursue. The specific origin of falconry is clouded in the mist of time. We do know that it has been practiced as a sport by commoners and kings, from Japan and China to medieval Europe. In Egypt, falcons were worshipped in temples and were among the many cult figures in Egyptian history. Falconry in Holland would become a major industry for over a hundred years. Falconers captured and trained birds for the nobility of Europe. With the invention of guns and the clearing of land for agriculture, falconry in Europe almost died out. In the Arabian Peninsula, the tradition of falconry has been sustained, and rather than dying out, the sport has been extended and modernized. Just as the way of life has changed in recent years, the true desert or Bedouin lifestyle has virtually disappeared. The purpose of falconry has begun to change from a method of food gathering to something more akin to the Western notion of sport. Two types of birds are predominant in Arabian falconry. First is the saker falcon. The saker is the bird most widely used by Saudi falconers. One of the larger falcons, she is known for her versatility and willingness to take large prey in the air or on the ground. The second variety is the peregrine. A smaller bird, the peregrine is always faster and specializes in taking quarry in the air. In each case, the preferred bird is the female, which is larger and better able to handle sizable quarry. Let's join a party of Saudi falconers in the northern Arabian desert, through which the annual fall migration is passing. While our focus is here in Arabia, other trapping parties will be operating in Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. The season has two distinct phases. The first of these is the trapping season, during which falconers who will trap their own hunting birds and trappers who capture falcons for resale move into camps all along the migration route. This camp is located in northern Saudi Arabia. And here we look at the trapping techniques which have evolved over the years. Trapping takes place in areas of relatively flat and open terrain. These areas lend themselves to easier spotting. Trappers spend hours daily scanning every inch of their surroundings both on the ground and in the air. The flat terrain and good visibility are also part of the attraction for the falcons, whose vision approximates that of 20 power binoculars. Not only does it help in their search for prey, but also they are more at ease. 
The openness allows them to see any other predator well in advance, even when they are resting on the ground. The trappers move out of camp before sunrise each morning, reaching their hunting area in the darkness of early dawn. In the cold autumn morning, they hope to spot a falcon still resting on the ground from the previous night, waiting to be warmed by the sun and hoping to catch an early meal. A wide variety of trapping methods are used by trappers in the Arabian deserts. The majority of these techniques involve the use of bait and an array of slip knots arranged to catch the toes of an attacking falcon. One of the most common techniques uses a pigeon. A light wire frame with a number of slip knots attached is fitted on the back of a pigeon. The slip knots are carefully checked to ensure that they will in fact slip very easily. Hopefully, once the falcon grips the pigeon, at least one toe will be inserted in a loop and the slip knot will be pulled tight. Techniques of using a pigeon vary according to the individual trapper. In most cases, however, having spotted a falcon on the ground or circling in the air, the trapper will try to pass nearby and toss the pigeon from the truck, hopefully without frightening the falcon. The trapper then removes himself some distance to see if the falcon strikes the pigeon. If the falcon fails to attack the pigeon or does so without ensnaring its foot, the process will be repeated until the falcon is snared or is frightened away. In each case, the pigeon must be re-caught. A special device has been designed by the trappers for this purpose. A length of wire with a hook on the end is used to catch the loops on the pigeon's back. The trapping process often involves a few moments of light entertainment. Some trappers will enhance this arrangement by tying a small sandbag to the pigeon harness with a length of twine. When the sandbag is added, the weight is sufficient to slow down even an eagle. This prevents the pigeon from taking off, but some trappers feel that only a naturally appearing pigeon, in other words, one that can fly, will attract the predator and trigger the instinct to attack. Alternatively, and certainly more humanely, a quail may be placed in a small wire cage and placed in view of a falcon. In this case, the looped snares are fitted to the cage rather than the quail itself. Oddly enough, the falcon, showing little fear of the cage, may land nearby, examine it, and then hop onto it in an effort to get the quail inside. Here again, the principle is the same, to ensnare the falcon's toes. A hungry falcon is certainly not above stealing a meal from another bird. Knowing this, the falconer may tie a lure with snares on the leg of a smaller hawk and release it in sight of the hunting falcons. With luck, the falcon will snare itself, trying to steal the prey from the decoy. The decoy is released once the falcon is sighted.
A very interesting variation is the use of a grate fitted with loops and buried in the sand. This is used in extremely open spaces. The grate is positioned in the shade of a bush or a shrub in the heat of the day. The falconer, having spotted a falcon, offers it a pigeon or a quail. If it kills and eats without being snared, he buries the grate and then tries to move the falcon gradually in that direction, hoping it will land seeking shade and then be snared. Particular attention is paid to camouflaging the grate, but the loops must remain upstanding. Other more conventional methods, such as fine mesh net, partly encircling a small pigeon or mouse, are also used. Given the intense interest and attention of some trappers, new methods are always evolving. In some coastal areas, trappers use car lights to immobilize grounded hawks at night and then cast fishermen's nets from open trucks to catch them. But a truly innovative idea has been the introduction of European high flyer roller pigeons to entice falcons soaring at midday. Whatever the method used, none are foolproof. If a pigeon left for a falcon is grabbed by a larger eagle or buzzard, once snared, the larger predator must be captured and released. But then may come a day when it all goes according to plan, and the suspense built up over previous days is ended. As soon as the falcon is clearly snared, the trappers quickly capture the bird and carefully wrap the wings to ensure that not a feather is broken or bent. Finally, the bird is hooded, which serves to calm it down. The falcon, once captured, becomes a subject of much discussion and review. The trappers, who have seen many falcons, have a whole range of criteria by which they judge a bird, and they evaluate it for later sale. Among Saudi falconers, the preferred birds are, of course, the larger, saker females. The lighter the bird's color, the better in their eyes, although a very dark bird can attract a high price. The Saudis also place high value on birds which have molted at least once in the wild. These birds, called haggards by European falconers and gurnas by Saudis, are seen as more experienced. They may be more difficult to train initially. They will usually prove themselves well as hunters. The falcon should have a heavy hooked beak, broad shoulders, short, thick wrists, and powerful, sharp talons. These are the attributes most likely to make her a good hunter. Most important is that the bird be recently caught. Training the caught falcon has several stages. The first is manning or taming the bird, followed by teaching her to come to the fist. She is then taught to come to a lure, and finally, she is introduced to quarry and induced to kill. This final step is called entering and making. The use of the word training is not really appropriate with falcons, particularly haggards, birds which have passed more than one season and must have become efficient hunters in order to survive. The Arab falconer intuitively recognizes the fact that the training process is really about overcoming the bird's instinctive fear of being in close proximity to man. The falcon is conditioned to being handled, fed, and returning from free flight to the fist. But no Arab falconer wants a bird which is too tame, as this may take the edge off its hunting skills. 
The training of a newly caught falcon actually begins almost immediately upon her arrival in camp. Typically, the new arrival is left hooded, with Jess's already on its legs. Its leash is attached to either a block or perhaps just a sandbag, which secures the bird and gives it a perch to sit and flex its feet. She will be left in a corner of the tent for a number of hours, getting used to the sounds of men around her engaged in usual camp life. At a time deemed sufficient for the bird to have built up some level of hunger, the falconer will pick her up and try to get her to settle down on his fist. Depending on the bird, this may involve a lot of screeching and flapping. However, once the bird has settled, the next step is to get her to eat. To do this, the falconer places a piece of meat near her feet and scratches her toes. The falcon will naturally peck at this irritation and eventually she will make contact with the fresh meat. Each of the falconers will go through this process with their birds. Patience, repetition and hunger eventually overcome the bird's natural fear and disposition to escape. The pace of this process depends on the personality of the individual birds. Some progress rapidly to a comfortable and relaxed state on the fist and among people, while others are more stubborn and distrustful. The next step is to train the bird to come to the fist from either the ground or the block. <laughs> Food, patience and perseverance sooner or later accomplish the desired behavior. From the beginning stages of training, the Arab falconer tries to teach the bird its name, usually by shouting it out whenever he has her attention. This, together with constant handling and touching, is a hallmark trait of the Arab trainer. Hooding, unhooding, touching and stroking, always in the presence of people, eventually breaks down the bird's inhibitions and the process of manning is complete. The introduction of the falcon to prey is relatively easy, particularly with a haggard bird which has killed in the wild. The falcon is first flown at pigeons for short distances on a light cotton line. Once she is confident on prey, she is ready to be taught to attack the bustard, the Arab hunter's main quarry. Under usual circumstances, this final stage of training takes place on the hunting grounds. With manning and initial training complete, camp will be moved to an area where reports have indicated bustard birds may be found, and hunting begins. In the modern age, hunting is rarely a solitary activity. No longer must the people of the desert rely on hunting as a source of food to supplement a sparse diet. Instead, these days, hunting is a more social event. And like all social activities, it is accompanied by much discussion and the obligatory serving of Arabic coffee. As the time approaches to move to the field, the introduction of modern technologies in traditional hunting becomes apparent. 
Each falcon, which will hunt, is fitted with a special transmitter to enable the hunter to follow it if it flies out of sight. Once the hunt is underway, more traditional techniques and skills come into play. Typically, hunting takes place along water courses and gravel flats holding some vegetation. Smaller ravines leading up to rocky open hillsides are also followed looking for quarry. Tracking is a skill at which Arab falconers excel. Not only can he identify and follow tracks in difficult terrain, a good tracker can differentiate individual bustards by their tracks. Once fresh tracks are found, the hunters carefully scan the area. To save time, the falconer will unhood the falcon and let the bird take advantage of its superior eyesight to spot the ever-elusive bustard. Once the bustard is spotted, the falcon launches itself from the wrist of the falconer, who has released his hold on her jesses. Initially, she will drop from the falconer and then rapidly recover height as she heads toward her quarry. What happens next is unpredictable. The saker falcon prefers to attack and kill on the ground. The bustard, however, may choose a variety of defensive tactics. Its first and most frequent is to bluff the falcon on the ground. It does this by extending its neck and chest feathers and stretching its wings to present the oncoming falcon with an image of a much larger bird than the bustard actually is. The bustard is, in fact, nearly double the size of the falcon. And this tactic may work, especially with younger, inexperienced birds. An older, more knowledgeable falcon will ignore this display and swooping once or twice to take the true measure of the bustard, go straight in and bind to it. in the hunt, every effort is made to retrieve bustards before they are actually killed. This is done to carefully stage the introduction of new young falcons to the bustard as prey. The falcon is first flown at a lure made of bustard feathers with meat attached.
later, when a bustard has been captured live, it is released in the open and given its condition, the new falcon has little difficulty in capturing and killing it. After doing this once or twice, the falcon will not hesitate to go straight for any bustard it sees. Other bustards may not even attempt the bluff tactic. Instead, immediately on sighting the falcon, they may take to the air. The bustard is a powerful flyer with a full complement of aerial maneuvers within his ability. With a head start or in the face of a heavy wind, the bustard can actually outfly a saker in a straight line. If the bustard chooses immediate flight, a long distance chase is likely to ensue. This can cover many kilometers over broken and difficult terrain, and during these chases, a special truck fitted with receiving equipment monitors the signal of the Falcon's transmitter. In the past, without this equipment, the hunters lost many falcons. The scout truck will track and pursue the birds. The other falconers will watch with binoculars and monitor the chase via their radios. If the bustard does begin to outpace the saker, the falconer may release a peregrine falcon, which is much faster and will attack the bustard in midair. If the bustard chooses to stay close to the ground, the superior skills of the saker will inevitably win out. Once the falcon has grounded the bustard, the falconers will approach the two birds with extreme care. In some cases, the bustard is not ready to give in. The falconer will call out the falcon's name and slowly move towards it so as not to frighten the bird. The falconer will then begin to deplume the bustard 
and let the falcon feed on its capture. Special attention is paid to allowing the falcon only a few morsels of meat. This is done to keep the falcon's hunting skills sharp. If she were full and heavy from eating, she might not go after another bustard. The falcon is rehooded and put back into the truck. She will be secured on a perch in the truck and wait for her next battle. After a full morning of scouting and hunting, the falconers will set up a makeshift camp for lunch. During lunch, the falconers will tend to any falcons which were injured in the fray of battle. This falcon cannot have its wing fixed in the field, so the falconers will tend to her later when they return to base camp. After lunch, the falcons will be loaded up in the truck and the search for more bustards continues. While searching for tracks, the falconers have come across rabbit traces and decide to let out their salukis, the Arabian equivalent of a greyhound, sleek and very fast. Today, the rabbit wins out and finds its hole just in the nick of time. At day's end, each falcon is fed prior to returning to camp.
Once in camp, the birds are unloaded and taken into a tent where they are unhooded and left to relax and groom themselves. This is also a time when birds which have broken feathers in the course of the day's combat are tended to. Arab falconers carefully collect and identify feathers molted by their birds for use at such times. Broken feathers are matched and repaired with great care and skill. The falconer inserts a metal brace into the new feather, glues it to the broken one, and creates a natural substitute. Once the glue dries, she will be able to take to the skies again. Evening is a time for recounting the day's events and reminiscing about previous hunts. The falconers will sit by a warm fire drinking tea or coffee. Each one telling stories about their falcons and wondering what the next hunting day will bring them. The falconers will spend the next month in the field hunting bustards with their falcons. All the bustards captured by the falcons will be used to feed the men who hunt with the falcons and the men who take care of the camp.
Jump. Jump. Through much of the world, the decline of falconry has corresponded to the development of sporting guns. No longer must man train a falcon for capturing food or use it in sport when the simple pull of a trigger can bring about the same result. Falconry in the Arabian Peninsula has not escaped the problems of falconry elsewhere. To these problems have been added the impact of commercialization arising from vast wealth in the oil-rich states and the universal demand for falcons. The increasing modernization of the sport and widespread use of four-wheel drive vehicles has put unprecedented pressure on the quarry to the extent that the McQueen's Bustard has been wiped out in many areas. The great tradition of falconry is slowly fading away. Today, in most of the world, falconry is seen as an archaic and perhaps eccentric undertaking of only passing interest. It is the romantic attraction of the desert and the nomadic life which attracts us as outsiders. To experience traditions passed down through the ages and to gain new knowledge of a declining sport before it slips away like grains of sand in the Arabian desert. <laughs>